What is up, everybody, and welcome to the Casual Wrestling Daily Podcast. I am your host, the Notorious Nerdy D, and tonight I am about to break down pro wrestling for all the true casual fans. So whether you are listening on podcast networks or watching on YouTube, make sure to like and leave a comment on this week's episode. With that being said, let's jump right into the first topic today. So this topic idea came about after watching the opening match of Monday Night Raw last night between Bianca Belair and Alexa Bliss. And I want to start off before we get into this topic, because I think it's important to start off with <clears throat> at least a little bit of positivity so you can see that that my heart is in the right place when I make this assessment of this situation. But I want to start off by saying Bianca Belair is an extremely talented wrestler. One of my favorite wrestlers of the past year, I, I after this uh after this conversation that may that may seem to be uh or, or may appear to not be the case, but she is one of my favorite wrestlers. But Bianca Belair is a talented wrestler who has struggled to connect with fans as a champion. And I and I I don't know if that's all her fault. And I, I think I'm gonna take the next, you know, 10, 15 minutes to kind of break down why I think this is happening. And I, I don't know if that's her fault or if WWE has struggled to book Bianca Belair in a way that allows her to fully showcase her abilities and resonate with her fans. <clears throat> but I do think it's important that especially as casual fans, that we take the time to kind of examine these issues. In order to understand the challenges that that are faced by by some of our favorite wrestlers. And you might ask me, you might ask me, D, why should I care about Bianca Belair's struggles? Well, let, let me tell you why you should care if you're a casual fan. Bianca Belair's struggles to connect with her fans, especially as a champion, are not, they're just a symptom of a larger issue. When wrestlers are not given the opportunity to succeed, due to lack of creative storylines or due to the ability to expand on their character, it sends a message that only certain wrestlers are valued and deserve uh, are deserving of success. And, and this thought process kind of holds back individual wrestlers and it also limits the potential of the wrestling industry as a whole by failing to showcase that that certain wrestlers have a diverse range of talents and perspectives. So when someone like Bianca Belair is pigeonholed into the same gimmick for over 365 days with no character development, you have to start to you start to have to inspect what what is happening. <clears throat> so if you're a casual fan of wrestling, it's important to be objective while supporting wrestlers that we like, because as casual fans, we have, a, we have a tendency to just defend. We just defend. You can't say anything bad about Dominic Mysterio. We have to just defend. You can't say anything bad about Roman Reigns. We have to just defend him. If I say something wrong about Seth Rollins, as casual fans, you, you just have to defend him. And if I say something wrong about Bel Bianca Belair, there's, there's a whole list of, of reasons people will come after me to say this is why I don't like her. But all I'm doing is trying to provide an honest feedback loop <clears throat> about how she can grow. <clears throat> now... Let's first start off this conversation by talking about, let's look at how WWE has booked Bianca Belair since WrestleMania. Let's go post-WrestleMania. Let's look at the matches on the premium live events and, and how they've booked her and, and, and try, to, try to determine if this, if this path that they took with Bianca Belair is one that could have bred more success. So let's go to WrestleMania. Right off the bat, at WrestleMania 39, night one, she defeats Becky Lynch in in an op, uh, uh, per, uh, just a beautiful finish to a to a long term storytelling program with Becky Lynch. It was it was from SummerSlam the year before all the way up to uh, WrestleMania, a redemption story for Bianca Belair that played out beautifully. It was it was incredible booking. So then we go post WrestleMania. She wasn't booked on WrestleMania Backlash. Why you ask? 
because she was immediately thrown into a messy feud with Sonya Deville that had a lot of potential. I liked where it was going, but it didn't, it wasn't given any time to breathe. It wasn't given any longevity, but instead it was just used to transition. Now let's examine this. Let's examine this, this program that could have had so much opportunity. She was thrown in to an immediate storyline with an authority figure, which can always work. These type of stories can always work. You have you have your baby face champion and you have your heel authority figure and, and they drop the ball. So immediately right out the bat, coming out of WrestleMania, coming out of probably the biggest win of Bianca Belair's career, we drop the ball on the, on the first storyline. And we give her a couple matches with Sonya Deville where she goes on to just kind of crush Sonya Deville and we transition into Hell, of the, Hell in a Cell where... It looks like we're going to get Asuka versus Bianca Belair, which is okay. Fresh meat. We're doing something new. I could see this. This could be a good first potential road bump for Bianca Belair in, in her journey to become an established babyface champion that the crowd can get behind. And what do we do? WWE panics and they throw Becky Lynch back into the match. So hell in a cell, we have this weird triple threat match. That involves Becky Lynch and Bianca Belair, a story that we thought culminated at WrestleMania. We're now going to do that again, but, but for good measure, Asuka gets thrown into it and we don't know why we don't understand. There's no storytelling being done here. And remember, this is all still in the Vince McMahon creative era. So I'm not blaming triple H or Vince McMahon. I'm blaming WWE for, for these booking issues. So Bianca Belair takes on Becky Lynch and Asuka. She wins, keeps her title, and we transition out of Hell in a Cell to be done with Becky Lynch for the moment, to be done with Asuka for the moment, and we move on to Money in the Bank where we get basically a throwaway program with Carmella. Now, up until this point, you tell me, where has there been any consistent storytelling? Sonya Deville, the return of Becky Lynch, Asuka, and now Carmella. It's, it's, a, it's just, a, just a whole group of, of, of ragtag opponents that we're, we're not building up any kind of... Ep- there's no rock versus stone cold. There, there's, no, there, there's no rivalry being formed here outside of, of the, the one that existed between Becky and Bianca before she was champion, but the, there's no new rivalry being born here. And so, so we get the throwaway match with Carmella and we, we transition into SummerSlam where we get, because this is SummerSlam and we need a big match, we're going to return back to what feels good. We're going to go back to comfort food, and we're going to culminate the Becky Bianca story one more time. Same thing we do with Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar. We're going to go back, and we're going to culminate the Becky and and the Bianca story one more time. We're going to do it one more time, and we did it one more time. And it was a good match, a solid match. Becky threw her shoulder out. We got the, the face turned by Becky Lynch. We got damage control. This is it, guys. This is where I thought we turned the corner. We're going to get what we're, we're about to get now. Here comes Bailey. We've got, we've got a rival. We've got something that makes sense in the works here. And I really thought, I really thought that to be true coming out of SummerSlam. I thought, all right, you know, she needed a little bit of time to get going, but this is it. This is where we turn the corner. And then we go into Clash at the Castle. And we get this weird three-way ragtag group of baby faces thrown together, which was Bianca Belair, Asuka, and Alexa Bliss, which no, no rhyme or reason other than I guess they all didn't like damage control, which is never a good reason to build a faction. It's never a good reason to build a faction is, is just to oppose the, the heel faction. It doesn't work. There's no chemistry. It, it never made sense. And these three girls never really looked to be cohesive or like they got along. And and then, so then we're thrown into this situation where Bianca basically squashes damage control, but she still needs Asuka and Alexa to help her out with damage control. And so clash at the castle, we get the weird, the, the, the triple, the, the two, uh, two teams of three tag team match, whatever you call that. Right. And so then we transition out of that and it looks like we're going to get, all right, we're going to roll into the story of Bailey versus Bianca Belair. But the problem is WWE, and this is now in the Triple H creative era, Triple H never, ever made Bayley feel like a credible threat to the title. We got extreme rules. It didn't feel like a credible threat. 
We got Crown Jewel. It, it didn't feel like a credible threat. And then it led us into Survivor Series with Team ba uh, Bianca versus Team Danilich Control with uh, Mia Yim and Rhea Ripley just randomly thrown into the match just because we need to fill out these teams and we don't have time to actually put together creative that makes sense. And that's it. That, that's 2022 in a nutshell for Bianca Belair. And you look at that. Somebody points at that. You know, and then we talk about 2023 real quick. She got a title match with Alexa Bliss that was 100% more about Alexa Bliss's story moving forward with Bray Wyatt than it was about Bianca Belair overcoming any adversity. For once, we got to see Bianca Belair kind of get beat down a little bit, which is a good first step, but don't get it twisted. This was about furthering Alexa Bliss's storyline and, and wasn't about building you know any vulnerability in Bianca Belair. But show me one point in time in 2022 that Bianca Belair, number one, ever felt like she was in danger of losing a title or two ever had a credible adversary that felt like they were on her level she was booked there, there's a muddy middle that she was booked into look Bianca Belair is not John Cena she can't talk on a microphone like John Cena she doesn't have the charm that John Cena has now Bianca Belair is a role model and that's a very attractive quality in a baby face. And Bianca Belair is extremely positive. But what she can't do is she can't engage the crowd the same way someone like John Cena can, where he can kind of he can kind of get the troops behind him. Bianca Belair doesn't have those same qualities on a microphone. And and I've heard people say that she's bad on a microphone. I don't think it's necessarily that she's bad on a microphone. I think she has one speed on a microphone, and that's that's underdog. Bianca Belair thrives in WWE as the underdog. When she is the champion, she 100% relies too much on her positivity. On this, I am the EST. I am the best. I Nobody can beat me. I will, I will persevere through whatever adversary is placed in front of me. It, it's never felt like she's you know, vulnerable since she won the championship. But yet, when she was the underdog, we constantly felt like she was vulnerable. We constantly felt like she couldn't get over the mountain that was Becky Lynch. And in turn, that, that made Bianca Belair extremely interesting. The problem for someone like Bianca Belair is I think they just... WWE doesn't know how to book her. They want to book her like John Cena. They want to book her like Roman Reigns. But Bianca Belair is not going to benefit from some record-setting title run like Roman Reigns. She, she lacks the ability to reinvent herself currently enough to go a long, uh, uh, an extremely long period of time holding the belt without dropping it. So how do you book Bianca Belair into a better position? That's the question, right? How do we how do we fix our Bianca Belair problem? Because she is a 100% commercially viable, uh, amazing wrestler who could be booked into way better positions and be booked into a huge superstar. But here's number one. Bianca Belair has to start to feel vulnerable. Baby faces can't be Superman. They can't just come in and beat everybody every week. And I know she took one pin to Bailey, but like that's forgettable. You, you, there's a reason that baby faces have to be beat down on a consistent basis because when they finally overcome whatever mountain they're trying to climb, it feels triumphant. With Bianca Belair, it just feels like she's walking on the clouds. She's being shoved down our throats, and I hate that because that is an IWC statement, right? The IWC always claim, well, John Cena is being shoved down our throats. Roman Reigns is being shoved down our throats. Ah, there's a little more nuance to those two than, than, than it's quick to jump to that conclusion. But with Bianca Belair, it really does feel like she's being shoved down our throats. Somebody that we want to like, they're going, no, no, no. You, you will like her and you will like her for these reasons. You know, being brutalized by Alexa Bliss is a start, but I don't think that made her feel vulnerable. I, I honestly think I saw the crowd start to turn on Bianca Belair in, in supposedly her home state. 
They're they're chanting one more time for Alexa Bliss. And and if WWE can't see, it is because she's being shoved down our throat. I don't know what what to tell them, right? We we have to believe at some point in time with Bianca Belair that her title run is in jeopardy. And I haven't felt that way. Every time I've ever asked the question, who's the next to lose their title? It, the, the, the thought doesn't even cross my mind that Bianca Belair is in that conversation. So how do we book? Bianca into a better position. Well, we have an opportunity right now. Rhea Ripley needs to win the 2023 Women's Royal Rumble. And she needs to immediately challenge Bianca Belair. And she needs to terrorize Bianca Belair for the next three months leading into WrestleMania. She needs to dominate her. It needs to feel like it is an inevitable uh, it's just it's going to happen. At WrestleMania, there's there's no chance. Rhea Ripley is going to beat Bianca Belair and become the new Raw Women's Champion. And when we get to WrestleMania, she needs to do just that. She needs to. And it needs to be an epic match, a back and forth match, a big match. They need to highlight this match and make it look like they gave everything they had, but Bianca Belair fell just short. And after Bianca Belair loses that title to Rhea Ripley, they need to turn around and immediately have Bianca Belair win the title back at whatever pay-per-view or premium live event is after WrestleMania. And you go, oh, I hate flip-flop booking. This isn't flip-flop booking. There, there has to be some parody created. This will help Rhea Ripley as well. It needs to feel like that at any time, either one of these women can lose the title. And what we need for the next six months post-WrestleMania is a power struggle between Rhea Ripley and Bianca Belair where they trade this belt back and forth in a series of big matches that feel like we never know who is going to win at a premium live event. Bianca Belair could benefit from this. Believe me, Rhea Ripley could benefit from this. Believe me. And after those six months... Whatever conclusion they come to, whether it's Rhea Ripley continuing on with the title or Bianca Belair continuing on with the title, it is time for WWE to test a Bianca Belair heel run. Just see what she's got in her. Just test it out. You have enough talent on the roster that you can tease it. You can test it. It doesn't have to be long. It can be very short-lived, but you saw the crowd turn on her this past Monday Night Raw. You saw the crowd go uh, j just turn and start to cheer for Alexa Bliss as she beat down what is supposed to be your baby face champion of the company. And so you there there is an opportunity later this year in 2023 to at least test what Bianca Belair has as a heel. Now, one thing I want to talk about is, I want to flip over here just a little bit, is is I want to talk about Jade Cargill in, in terms of, because there are some similarities in Jade Cargill and Bianca Belair. And there's a lot of differences. The biggest difference being, if you're going to book your, your champion as a Superman-like character, the prime example is Jade Cargill. Squash matches. Bianca Belair should have been squashing every opponent she stepped in front of. If this was the line of booking, it should feel like she is unbeatable. But what Bianca's been booked for just match after match after match where Carmella gave her a run for her money. It feels like Asuka gave her a run for her money. It feels like Bailey gave her a run for her money. Never felt vulnerable. It just always felt like it, it felt like a video game that is constantly uh, what do you call it? Uh, like balancing the skill, like Mario go kart, right? Where if you get too far ahead, they pull all the all the other characters back up to you. It feels like that with Bianca Belair. It feels like no matter who she gets in the ring with, they're going to have an equal opportunity. But ultimately, they can't beat her. With Jade Cargill, we know right now. We know Jade's the baddest bitch, and she's going to go in there and she's going to beat everybody's ass. And that's I'm all good with that. That, that is how you build up a baby face to feel unbeatable. You use the Goldberg mentality. But, I mean, look, the reality is, if you want to go back, look back to NXT Bianca Belair all the way up until Bianca Belair from Monday Night Raw last night. There just hasn't been much character development. There hasn't been enough growth. There hasn't been enough change to to really get fans to buy. I think the, the shtick is getting a little tired. The gig is up. 
The fans are starting to go, all right, enough of this. And, and Bianca's always going to have her hardcore fans who will defend her, and that's great. That, that fan base will never go anywhere. But I think that the casual fans are starting to get that itch where they go, ah, I'm going to need to see something new out of Bianca Belair. It's time. It's time to see something. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, like I said, we book 2023 with Rhea Ripley and Bianca Belair going back and forth with, with, a, with quite a few. T- I'm, I'm not a big fan of this idea that titles need to stay on one person for an extended amount of time. I think in any type of real life, if, if Triple H, uh, let me walk this back here. Kevin Owens came out the other day and said that Triple H is using logical booking. Uh-uh. That's not true. People don't hold titles this long in, in real life. Look at the MMA. Nobody holds a title for a year. Hardly. I mean, it, you, it, they're anomalies. They're special people. But for the most part, you get a champion who then meets somebody with a different style who beats that champion, and the titles tend to play hot potato. So I think Bianca Belair and Rhea Ripley need to play hot potato with that title in order for Bianca Belair to, to become a true babyface superstar. All right, guys, let me take a short break to remind you that I've been putting a lot of time and effort into creating this podcast, and I am grateful for all the support I have received so far. If you are enjoying the show, I would really appreciate if you considered supporting me on Patreon. By joining the Patreon community, you'll be able to help me continue producing high-quality content and bringing new and interesting ideas to the table. Plus, you will get access to exclusive bonus content and other perks starting late January. January. I am so grateful for the support you guys give me, and I can't wait to see how this channel continues to grow. If you are interested in joining the Patreon community, just click the link in the description of this video or go to patreon.com slash the casual wrestling show. Thank you guys again for listening. I can't wait for you guys to see the cool stuff we do this year. And uh, I'd like to give a shout out to the current Patreon producers of this show. It's Zinni, Randall Beatley, Randall, tell me if I'm saying that right, Randall Beatley, who is the host of the Slapping Meat Wrestling Podcast, so go check that out, and uh, Ian the Noobs Newberry, so thank you guys for being Patreon producers of the show, Uh, let's get back to it. All right, let's run down some, uh, some quick hits here. It appears that there is some unrest among the ranks of All Elite Wrestling. According to Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer Radio, people within the company are not particularly happy with recent comments made on Dax Harwood's podcast. While the specific details of these comments have not been disclosed, it has been speculated that they may have to do with AEW's stance on former WWE World Champion CM Punk. Some within the company are reportedly against the idea of bringing Punk back, and it is believed that these comments may have further fueled the backlash. <laughs> I mean, this is funny. This is fu- I read this article. This is funny. This is somebody dancing around the idea. We know exactly who and what this is. This is the, the AEW Mean Girls now pointing their finger at the next uh, self-appointed bad guy, which is Dax Harwood, right? Dax, you can't go on a podcast and and say things that change the narrative that we've had for the last, you know, six months. Hey, our story has kind of stuck and everybody's believing it. You can't go out there and and make it seem like CM Punk might be the good guy. I have a hard time watching AEW and I'm doing it and I'm enjoying some of the product, but I have a hard time watching it knowing that Tony Khan has no fucking spine. I mean, Tony Khan is a little bitch. He needs to step up and tell these guys to shut the fuck up. He needs to step up and tell these guys, if you don't like it, take your shit and go. Because you cannot run a company where you allow people to dictate just even the messaging that comes out of your company. So if a well-liked person like Dax Harwood goes on his podcast and says something that these, you know, these elite don't like, they then come back and they bitch and they cry and they complain to the Dave Meltzers of the world. Like this is, this is getting ridiculous. 
This is, it, it's ridiculous. It's obvious to me at this point. At one point, I was saying, like, there's a possibility that CM Punk could have, you know, could have not been in the wrong. At this point, I am convinced the elites are the problem. They don't want anybody else playing on their playground. They don't want anybody else changing the rules. And they don't want anybody else changing the optics. And, and so here I go. Is the IWC... You know, they've stood behind the elite. They've stood behind Kenny Omega. Their Lord and Savior, Kenny Omega. But is the IWC going to turn on Dax Harwood now? Is the IWC going to turn on FTR? Because this is one of their darlings. This is somebody that the IWC loves to, to place on this pedestal. Mm, but it looks like it looks like Dax Harwood kind of chose his side of the street and his side of the street was CM Punk. Now he did go on to say, I wish everybody would just get along, but of course that is completely ignored by the elite. They choose just to, to come out and, and kind of just drop a big, big pile of dog shit all over another person who chooses to go against the standards that they have set up for their little playground. I mean, it's, it's sickening at this point. I have a hard time. I want to like the elite. I want to like the Young Bucks. I want to like Kenny Omega. They are entertaining, but they're just kind of dog shit people. Like when you read this kind of stuff and you see that people within the company are, are against the idea of bringing CM Punk back and, and you know who they're talking about and they're just kind of dog shit people. Like I, I, at this point, I hope CM Punk comes back to WWE. I hope FTR goes to WWE and I hope they have, uh, I hope they have uh, extremely productive runs in the company, whether or not that'll happen. I don't know, but I hope it happens. Uh, in a recent interview on Monday night raw, Dominic Mysterio spoke about his time in prison and how it has affected him. Mysterio, who is the son of WWE legend, Ray Mysterio stated that it, he is now a changed man after serving time behind bars. All right, guys. I mean, y'all know my love for Dominic Mysterio runs extremely, extremely deep, but can we now determine, I mean, can we make the, the determination that Dominic Mysterio is officially a comedy act inside of WWE and it's good one. Look, this is where he belongs. That, that I couldn't help but laugh at that, that piece they did yesterday on Monday night raw. I thought it was fucking great, but we have to admit, you guys have to admit Dominic Mysterio is not that guy. <clears throat> He's not going to be all the, all the people who came out in defense of him when I called him on all his bullshit early on. He's not that guy. He's not going to be a big-time superstar. He is going to be the next Santino Morella. That's what he's going to be. That's, that is the ceiling for Dominic Mysterio. But, hey, shout out to Dominic Mysterio. He's got a T-shirt now. He's got a T-shirt that says something like, bail me out, mommy. You guys all going to go run and buy that t-shirt? All you assholes who attacked me when I first said that Dominic Mysterio wasn't that guy? Are you guys all going to go run out and buy that new Dominic Mysterio t-shirt? I mean, this is, this is where we are. And, and, I, and I'm not, the funny thing about this is, is I like this. I'm in favor of this. I like the idea of Dominic Mysterio being a comedy act. I think that he will settle in and do well here. I just need everybody to admit that I was right when I said Dominic Mysterio is not that guy. And Dominic Mysterio wasn't ready for the main, the main roster. And Dominic Mysterio wasn't ready to main event uh, Monday Night Raws with Edge. That's all I want. That's all I need you people to do. Hey, look, he's a comedy act. Judgment Day, they're going down the road as a comedy act. All of the people who defended them and said, just let this play out. This is ultimately, Triple H never had a ton of faith in Judgment Day early on and so this is what happens he it's kind of run its course there's nothing left for judgment day to do they're not going to let them go into anything that affects the bloodline they're not going to let them get involved in mainstream storylines so they're going to let them be a side act that has kind of a comedy routine that people can get behind but dominic mysterio is so bad at this guys that he's actually good like that's what's happening here we, they, Triple H finally realized that Dominic Mysterio is so bad at getting over and being likable that it's actually becoming kind of a good running joke that, that we could just put him in these weird, funny situations, the, these off-screen segments, these social media, get into fights with his family segments, and it will breed success. I don't know. I think that this, this always breeds short-term success. 
more than it does long-term success. I don't think that when you're a comedy act, you don't, there's not a lot of long-term success in that you, you do have to kind of uh, grow, but, but for the time being, it seems like that this is where they pigeonholed him and I'm, I'm all for it. I'm good with that. All right, story number three. So according to Dave Meltzer, Cody Rhodes' return to the WWE will not be a surprise. WWE has started promoting his in-ring return through a multi-part video series on Monday Night Raw, and it is rumored that Rhodes will have a high spot on the WrestleMania 39 card. Previously, there had been speculation that Rhodes might uh, make a surprise entrance into the Royal Rumble match, but it seems that will not be the case. What a missed opportunity. I mean, we waited... Six months knowing that Cody Rhodes would probably return at Royal Rumble and then you get gun shy and two or three weeks before the Royal Rumble, you go, let's just start, let's start promoting him. Let's get him out there. It seems like a missed opportunity for an event that is basically just all about surprise returns. Nobody remembers really what happens in the Royal Rumble. What they, what they remember is the epic surprise returns. So you got it. The question you have to ask yourself now is what other surprises are planned for the Royal Rumble? Because there's got to be something, right? There's got to be something. This is the night where we expect surprises. And Charlotte Flair just came back. Becky Lynch just returned. You, you've had, you, you, you've already teased your Cody Rose return. So you know what this is solidifying guys, right? You know what this means. You know, by them pulling the trigger on Cody Rhodes. Uh, on, on teasing Cody Rhodes' return before Royal Rumble. This means th- they've solidified The Rock. Th- that's all this could mean. They've locked down The Rock. This, this solidifies the fact that The Rock has been locked down for the Royal Rumble and for WrestleMania 39. It has to. That is the only logical possibility for why you would begin to do this because you have to have a surprise that is even bigger than the return of Cody Rhodes and that has to be the rock which means the rock is probably winning Royal Rumble which means they're trying to get out in front of getting Cody Rhodes in front of people and not build up the expectation because there's a lot of people who want and think that Cody Rhodes should win the Royal Rumble but I think that this is their way of tampering expectations and and I think that this pretty much solidifies and guarantees that the, uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson has been locked down for the Royal Rumble and for WrestleMania 39. And, and The Rock will win the Royal Rumble this year. What's up, guys? I have an exciting contest for you today. If you go to Spotify or Apple Podcast and leave us a five-star review on this podcast and tag us on one of your social media accounts, you will be entered to win a $25 WWE gift card. It is the perfect opportunity to show your support for the show and to get your hands on some sweet WWE merchandise. The winner will be announced at the end of January, so make sure to follow us on social media to stay updated. Don't wait, leave your review, tag us on social media to qualify. We'll contact the winner through their social media account. So make sure to follow us and stay updated. Good luck and thank you guys for your continued support. All right, it is time for Wrestling Change My Mind. This is where I give you a point of debate that I kind of stand behind, and I want you guys to either duet this video on TikTok or YouTube Shorts or comment your answer in the comment section of this video and uh, change my mind on the statement that I'm about to make. And that statement is this week, Austin Theory has become a no-personality, cookie-cutter shell of himself who sucks all of the personality out of Monday Night Raw main events. Change my mind. So do at that or comment that on uh, in the comment section of this video and let's have a discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm interested to hear the reactions that gets because that is really my... That is my thought line right now, and I will speak on it more tomorrow after you guys make some of your arguments. But that is all the time we have today. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Casual Wrestling Daily Podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's show. As always, if you have any suggestions or thoughts for future episodes, please don't hesitate to reach out and drop those ideas in the comment section. And don't forget to join us tomorrow, same time, same place for more wrestling talk. Until then, let's ring the final bell.
Step in the ring, if you ready, let's go. Hey, hey. Casual wrestling community show. You already know. Talking WWE. Keep it rolling and hosted by Notorious Nerdy D. Hey. Dope show that you gon' find. Tune in cause it's online. Hit him with a figure four leg lock, pie driver, a clothesline. We bringing that heat like the show. But you should 